All right. So this was, let's see, I want to make me a presenter. So this was an, this is a 68 year old, and let me show the images here. This was an incidental finding. Uh, my colleague ran into this uh, reading a post op chest radiograph. And this was an outside CT load in our system. So 68 year old who had a parasophageal hernia repair for shortness of breath, no other imaging. And I don't have the radiograph, but he was uh, looking for something that was explaining a right paratracheal abnormality. And you can see there's this fluid attenuation. Should, and you guys do see the CT, right? Yes. Yeah, this fluid attenuation structure adjacent to the esophagus here kind of looks like a duplication cyst, but this is what's fun. We have a pulmonary sling. And like any good thing, there's a more anomalies. There's a left SVC over here. Uh, we have a small trachea. And I did load it into the 3D or the, the, the um, virtual bronchoscopy. I won't, I'll spare you guys the time. But it does have complete tracheal rings, which kind of fits with the configuration of this. And just for fun, also has bilateral hype arterial lungs. So we have left pulmonary isomerism, no polysplenia or anything else. I couldn't find anything below the abdomen, but so, and there's, there's the whole reason this even showed up was they repaired this, but it makes you wonder if that's why the patient was really short of breath or not. So insulin detected pulmonary sling, left SVC, presumed bronchogenic or other foregut duplication cysts and abnormal airways with two left lungs. We don't see a, a middle lobe. Almost looks like a single lobed right lung. There may be a little remnant fissure there. So. Jeff, was that esophageal duplication thing, um, was that separate from esophagus? It wasn't just dilated esophagus. I'm no, sorry, was esophagus it? is there. I think it's a, it's a foregut duplication cyst of some sort. OK. But it's cool. a congenital yeah, smorgasbord. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. How she if you can find the chest radiograph, that would be great. If you can ever find it and share it with us, that would be Yeah, great. unfortunately, I don't have a ladder. It's just a portable, but I do have the... Oh, uh, uh, okay. That's okay. All right. Um, let me show you. Um, I'll just do this one, too. Um, so this is... This patient is... Uh, let's see. Show the CT. Uh, in his 50s and has chronic kidney disease and had a CT like this, showing subglottic tracheal stenosis, a little bit of scarring in the apices, but really not much else to get excited about the lungs. Has a heart, little bit of fibrosis or something in the bases. But I have a bronchoscopy that shows the, you can see the narrowing here. And they actually went in and I got a post picture here where they, let's see if I can find it, where they sort of, help treat this with, I don't think they lasered it or something or used a, a thermal thing, but tried to open up this airway a bit. Here's the coronal. And uh, I did some digging because this was just billed as a subglottic stenosis and a list of cases someone shared with me. But it turns out the patient has a granulomatosis with polyangiitis and had ultimately succumbed to renal failure. Um, but this is just where the only lung finding is really isolated subglottic stenosis, which, you know, we know is one of the... Um, manifestations of GPA. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of, this isn't anything fancy, but it's a nice example of, um, this is a patient who had um, a testicular malignancy that, and was getting chemotherapy. And of course, bleomycin is one of the common ones. So this is back from October, young man. And uh, is that 2016? You can see had a metastasis. Then he gets bleomycin, we image him and see beautiful patchy peripheral consolidation, ground glass, sort of these arcades along the surface, subpleural sparing. So gorgeous organizing pneumonia. There's the metastasis there. And with cessation of the bleo and some corticosteroids. You can see it's starting to melt away a little bit here. But I think this is one of the explanations why we see subpleural sparing with NSIP. You imagine if this were to have fibrosed, 
you would see that distribution. But this is just a drug-induced OP, very classic example. And then last case is just kind of a another cute case. So uh, I'll show the non-con first. So this is um, this is a younger woman who's got chronic. Uh, heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, I believe. And she's got valves, mitral tricuspid anaplasty, mitral valve. And this calcification was noted in the left atrium here. So you can see it's separate from the wall. And then I have an older CT angio that just shows a, a sort of an unusual manifestation of, of left atrial thrombus up against the wall, posterior wall there didn't have calcium that we could see at that time. Um, the appendage itself, don't really see much in there. It's not really any, it's probably, it's either thrombosed or slow flow in there. Um, and uh, nothing in the in the ventricle. So um, you know, more, most often when I see thromb things back here, I've seen osteosarcomas and other things, but this is sort of a layering thrombus that manifested with calcium on a, on a CT. So not, not particular, but the sling was my good case this week. Jeff, did she have atrial fibrillation? I don't know. She was really young. I, I don't think she did. You can see she's had a, she's had sternotomy. Um, she's had um, her valves. Mm -hmm. so I, I can't, I don't know all the details behind it, but uh, as far as I know, she did not. And her left atrium isn't particularly that big. And, you know, given a, her, this is a tissue valve, so she may not have been anticoagulated at the time. So a little bit of an unusual thrombus in the left atrium. All right. Well, that's all I was able to conjure up this week. But I was so excited about the sling. Everything else just was, <laughs> just seems such a letdown. Jeff, could I show one quick uh, fun case that Howard, I think, will enjoy in particular? Absolutely. So um, this is an elderly woman, a woman in her 70s. Um, she was in pretty good health until uh, the age of about 70. Um, and this chest radiograph is from a few years ago. And at this point, she had mild lung edema. You can few, see a few septal lines and some thickening of this inferior accessory fissure here, small pleural effusion. So this was heart failure. Her lungs were fairly clear until, until recently. She's had a series of pneumonias. Um, let me show you a CT scan from 2014 to show, again, that lungs are pretty clear. Um, might have a couple of little holes here in the lungs and um, maybe a couple little things down here, a couple little spaces, um, and some dependent atelectasis. She's a, she smoked for uh, one year back in her 20s. That was 50 years ago, so she's not considered to be a smoker. And she doesn't use uh, illicit drugs or anything. So those were the lung bases then. And then let's advance a couple of years. At this point, she had a pneumonia in the left upper lung. But notice what's happening in her bases. She has developed this peripheral emphysema. And it gets worse down at the bottom. So we've got a lot of emphysema now. Um, it's mostly at the periphery and in the bases. So between 2014 and 2016, uh, we developed this emphysema pattern. She was tested for alpha-1 and trypsin deficiency, and she doesn't have any uh, thing that comes up on serology for that. And then this is another year or so later, the emphysema is much more severe. And it's just take, taking out most of this left lung. She also does not inject Ritalin tablets. So she has this basal predominant uh, emphysema, basal and peripheral, sort of paraseptal emphysema pattern. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> it's progressive. She doesn't have any particular lung disease that I can identify here. I think the ground glass abnormality here is a combination of edema and crowded lung because of the emphysema taking up so much space, the remaining lung is going to be relatively hypoventilated and is grayish white, I think, just because of hypoventilation. So rapidly progressing uh, basal emphysema here not alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So about, I think in 2015, a diagnosis of pulmonary amyloidosis was made based on her becoming short of breath 
and um, she got a she had a she got a transbronchial biopsy. I think that led to, there was an open there, there was an open biopsy that led to the diagnosis of amyloidosis in her lung. There were never any amyloid nodules, and I believe that this emphysema is like what Howard has shown in in people with um, light chain deposition disease that forms cysts and some emphysema spaces around around the nodules. In her case, I think the amyloidosis is diffuse. And she, I think this emphysema is that hollowing out of lung that we've seen in the cystic form before, but I think now is really a diffuse uh, emphysema. So I had never seen a case of emphysema related to amyloidosis before, uh, but I think that's what's going on in this case. And it turns out that there is, there was a publication in 2007, uh, amyloidosis contributing oh, the development of emphysema. This was reported in chess, but there were no pictures in this well, thing. We're not very much in agreement with everybody. And this was a 35-year-old African American man who died of his disease. Um, he had an autopsy, and there was this diffuse emphysema here. So, amyloidosis can can cause, I think. Um, Emphysema and amyloid in the cases I've seen when it's nodular is worse in the bases So we published a case um, in a few years ago in radiology of a person with base basal nodular Partly ossified pulmonary amyloidosis. It was one of the you know quiz cases that radiology published They they'd give you the quiz and then a couple months later. They'd show you the the answer that was amyloidosis that person had a lot of cysts and emphysema along with the amyloid nodules in the basis. I think this is a case which we don't have nodular amyloid, we have diffuse amyloid. It was a light chain, lambda chain uh, deposition because of her myeloma, which was diagnosed about, I think, eight years ago. So amyloid and emphysema. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you guys might have seen a case like this, uh, this extreme thing. I, this sort of blew me away. Wow. What's the proposed mechanism? Is it just, no, I mean, I can understand cysts from an airway obstruction. How do they explain emphysema? Because does the amyloid lead to tissue destruction? What, what the pathologist said, who reviewed the, the, our current case, is that there was a, a ton of emphysema and there were lots of, the emphysema was around giant cells. So I think that the, I think that basically what's happening is there's an inflammatory response to the amyloid and these uh, macrophages are trying to digest the amyloid. And I think the increased macrophage turnover with the spilling of their digestive enzymes is what's eating away at the lung. So I think it's an attempt at clearance of the amyloid that releases all these digestive enzymes from the inflammatory cells. And I think that's what's eating the elastic tissue of the, of the lung. Yeah, certainly people have postulated that that elastolysis is a cause of the cystic changes in patients with protein deposition in the lung. So in a general sense, this would be the most florid one I've ever seen if we're seeing a manifestation of really florid elastolysis. Can you guys see the underlining I did here on this, on the article? Sorry, the underlying what? Can you see the, uh, the PDF here with the blue um, yeah, highlight? Yeah. It's just so, small, you can't see it, but I can yeah, see it here. Yeah. Studies in murine models with amyloid have shown an increase in inflammatory cells, oxygen radical accumulation, and increased elastase-like activity leading to emphysema. Oh. So they also talked about amyloid deposition in the terminal or respiratory bronchioles that might lead to the, here's the air trapping in cysts. I think this is a good explanation for cysts, but for emphysema, I think it's probably the um, digestion from these inflammatory cells. Wow. Okay. Wow. Wow. The pulmonary sling looked boring. <laughs> no, I, I liked your pulmonary sling. So why don't we just trade? All right. <laughs> yeah, that's impressive. Okay. Well, who wants to go next? Um, I can go next if you like. All right. Sure. Okay. Um, recently, we had a patient with atroesophageal fistula as a complication of left atrial RF ablation for atrial fibrillation. 
and then I looked for some others that I had, and I actually found two others that I don't think I've shown before. So I'm going to show you all three of them today, and I'll start out with the oldest one I have, I think, which is this one. And of course, I'm really going to go right to the, the atrium to show you the findings. So let me just do that and show you. Um, this is why patients may die with an atroesophageal fistula. This person did, and you can see air embolism there. And I will show you the finding that he had on imaging, which is down here. And this is the only finding. So here we have what is presumed to be, and I'll make this bigger now, presumed to be a clot, presumably a clot adherent to the wall of the atrium where the injury is located. Obviously, there's a tube in the esophagus, but the imaging finding is this right here. And presumably, at some point in time, air entered from the esophagus into the injured atrium and resulted in that air embolism. But this is the finding in this particular patient. So this is the site of injury and again, presumably the clot in this patient. Yeah, Howard, and the location is good too, because it's right next to the pulmonary vein osteum where they would have ablated. Okay, okay. And the esophagus. And the esophagus, okay. I'll show you the next one that I have which is this one. Let me just put up the, uh... the only history I could get in this patient was the following. So, you know, he had that history and then he presented with chest pain and, and then things, terrible things happened and they took him to the OR and so on. So let's have a look at this patient here, the finding on this non-contrast CT is the presence of a little air right here where there should not be air. So in relation to the atrium and the esophagus in that location, let me bring up another image to show you that. So here is some soft tissue abnormality around the esophagus, but contact of air with the atrium where it shouldn't really be. So that's the site of the injury in this particular person right there. Is this is this a recent case, Howard? Because I'd seen the this other one. one before, but this one looks new. This one is not so recent, no. Okay. No. And I don't know if the uh, arrest was related to a sudden air embolism, for example. I'm not quite sure what happened, but this was the CT that was obtained. And then this one is the recent one that we have. Um, this one, the presentation was um, relatively chronic because he had a set of symptoms and he was imaged a lot because I'll show you the findings in a moment. But as you might imagine, um, surgeons are reluctant to intervene until they really have to when a diagnosis is made. So let me show you some findings I'm going to put up. A clinical thing over here just for a moment as you can see there and this one was also the finding here is really in relation to the esophagus which contains some contrast medium here and as we go lower down I'll show you maybe on a different one where there is A subtle finding here, which, and here you have to track obviously air in the esophagus and look for any soft tissue or air that you think may not be in the esophagus or at least abnormal air. So for example, here, maybe a small collection of air that is a little bit eccentrically located relative to air in the esophageal lumen. So is this air um, an ulcer? Is it air in the esophageal wall? and in the mediastinum. So that's the finding then. And I'll show you another, and he had CTs at very frequent intervals here, but I'll show you another one. 
And you can see the same thing here with contrast medium in the esophagus. You can see the lumen of the esophagus, but you can also see there's some contrast medium and or some air slightly eccentrically located with respect to the esophageal lumen and of course just behind the atrium. And then I will show you here that at some point, and I thought I had it there, he had endoscopy that showed an ulcer there. And then I will show you the most recent one. So let me just make this big and take that away and show you that there's a nice correspondence between what we see on that esophagram and then you put up the CT in the sagittal dimension. So here we have the esophagus. You can see the ulcer that's formed, fairly broad-based ulcer. I mean that exact location. And here is the corresponding uh, CT where you can see a nice correspondence between the ulcer containing air or contrast medium and the back of the atrium as you see there. So this person did have neurological symptoms. They weren't sure initially whether they were due to air embolism or not, but they were certainly worried. So ultimately when this developed and at some point in time they decided to operate on him and you can see over there that what they found right there. So there was that ulcer and they fixed that as you can see there. So just three nice cases of the esophageal pathology and periesophageal pathology with atroesophageal fistula ultimately. And then this person um, was discharged, so he was fixed. All right, I'll show one more quick case just because it's a nice example of one we showed last week. So this is a patient um, in the oncology and he has a adenoid cystic carcinoma of palate. And he was followed up periodically at some point in time. Um, this was identified. So he has this sort of nodular opacity in the right suprahyla lung, which was a new finding from the previous exam. On CT, I'll show you that he has that. He has lots of small nodules elsewhere, but I really want to show you that because it's a nice example of endobronchial tumor. So here you can see that the opacity that we saw in the radiograph is part of what we see over there. But you can see the bulk of the tumor in the airway and you can see how it's growing into the anterior, posterior, segmental airways. There's some mucus presumably. Here is the tumor there and he has small nodules. So pulmonary nodules, but also one quite large endobranchial metastasis growing in the airways of the right upper lobe, as you see there. Okay, Jeff, those are my cases. All right, thank you. Who wants to go next? Okay. Jeff. Yes. It's uh, Godwin. Could I, uh, could I show the article that, um, that we posted a few years ago that had some similarities to the current case? Sure, go ahead. Well, this is from um, radiology, uh, one of those unknown cases. Um, and this was a, an elderly woman again. And she's got nodular basal predominant amyloid deposits with ossification. So the bright stuff here is the ossification within these amyloid nodules. And you can see that she's got quite a bit of emphysema too. So cysts mm -hmm. and emphysema in this case. Yeah. So I just wanted to point out these similarities to um, the current case that I showed earlier. Okay, that's it. Yeah, great. All right. Thanks, David. All right, who's next? Jeff, I, I can go. All right. Hopefully you can hear me reasonably well on the phone. Yeah, it's actually very clear. Okay, good. This is a patient who came in last week. And as you can see, she's the image is not lying there that she is 28 weeks pregnant. She's a generous sized lady, but I think despite that, you can still see that in the fact that she's not taking that big of a breath, that her radiograph is not normal. And this was an outside radiograph, but it looks very... It's kind of uniformly hazy, and maybe you can tease out some tiny little nodules in here. Um, her her diaphragm is elevated, and then she has, you know, maybe right peritracheal peritracheal stripe looks a little plump. So she underwent a CT at the outside hospital, and here's the CT, and you can see the diagnosis there, which I'm going to hide. 
But it's a really nice example, and unfortunately these are three millimeter slice thickness, but she just has innumerable tiny little miliary nodules. And um, what's really interesting, there's a little bit of relative sparing of this, of the portions of her right middle and lower lobe along the diaphragm. And I don't know if that's just due to the, the her body habitus and the fact that her liver is up like that. But um, but anyway, so no known malignancy, no TB risk factors. Her PPD was negative, and she's from the Central Valley, and we thought this was going to be Coxy, most likely, which at 28 weeks pregnant poses a lot of different problems for the patient. Uh, first of all, that most of the or the antifungals can be teratogenic, but um, she was started on 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 amphotericin, which I guess is less teratogenic to to the fetus. And eventually her, her different serologies came back positive for COXI. So this was a, an IgG, her IgM was negative. The, the, pulmon, uh, the ID guys and the pulmonologists thought that this was most consistent with COXI. And her, her history kind of fit too, that she had three weeks of night sweats, dry cough, five days worsening, and unexplained weight loss as well. But I show this that that uh, pregnancy actually is a risk factor, known risk factor for disseminated coxy. She had no other issues. And here's an article just talking about it. And what's interesting too, I found is that the later in pregnancy, especially in the third trimester, puts patients at increased risk of of worse, more uh, more severe disease. So I thought this was an interesting case of what you wouldn't necessarily think of as an immunocompromised patient, you know, in the traditional sense, having disseminated coxie because her pregnancy does make her relatively immunocompromised. Yeah, you know, there are also ethnic susceptibilities. So dark-skinned people, Filipinos in particular, are supposed to have right. a higher rate. Right, and and I think she's Hispanic. I don't know her exact descent, but you're yeah, you're exactly right. And we see that a lot with patients that coming from that come in from the Central Valley. Wonder if this was probably the site of her primary infection too. If she just had a, a pneumonia at some point, mm -hmm. left her with a scar. I don't I don't know. I that's my theory, but I I don't know for sure. But yeah, that's a thought. And reactive yeah. adenopathy and yeah. So that What's case is okay. Hmm. Was there lymphadenopathy too? I didn't. I didn't look. Yeah, there was a little bit of lymphadenopathy. So yeah, you you can see she's got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. And and it's somewhat asymmetric. There's a little left hilar. I I mean I know that. I don't know what you guys think of it when you hear as sarcoid being described as it it can present with a miliary pattern. I always feel like, you know, you tend to see areas where it clumps more than others, and it's really perilymphatic, but. Yeah, oh, I, this looked like a, a pure miliary pattern to me. I think right. miliary, quote, miliary sarcoid comes more from a radiograph and not a CT. Yeah. So that case is okay, but this case takes the cake. This is courtesy of Brett Elliker. And this, we start back in 2014, and I'll give you a second to find his lung cancer. It's not too, it's not too subtle here on the PA view. When I show you the lateral view, you'll see it even better right sitting back here and so it was behind the heart on the pa view and so the, he undergoes uh you know ct at this time before he underwent left lower lobectomy and i'll, I'll talk about the pathology of this in a second because it was a an unusual his, histopathology which i don't think affected the outcome of what i'm going to show you next but he had one lymph node that was positive at the time this was late 2014 early 2015 Subsequently underwent a bunch of restaging exams and then it, after his lobectomy, and this was, as you can see, August of 2016, had a new subcarinal lymph node. This was subsequently biopsied by bronchoscopy and confirmed to be a metastasis. He also had a, a small little internal mammary node right here that I guess was hot on a PET. But they placed a fiducial in that, the, bronchoscopically, in that subcarinal lymph node and then they fried it with 50 grays. They were being pretty aggressive in treatment of him. So you can see this is after radiation. The radiation was done in October. And so you've, you've, you're left with a metal seed, but not much else there. Then he comes back in March and has this CT. And you can see that he now has quite a irregular and ratty looking air, airway in this area. And the seed is practically in the, in the airway here. And yeah, and it just looks 
pretty nasty here. And so I'm going to, so he comes back in a, a week and a half ago with hemoptysis. And I'll poll the audience where you think the hemoptysis is coming from based on this. If anybody wants to take a stab at it. Is it coming from a pulmonary artery? <laughs> or aorta? One of the aorta? Yeah, well, Jeff is right. Here is what here's what the uh pulmonary the right pulmonary artery now looks like. Um so yeah, this whole area is just one big necrotic mess. And I will say that in between these two studies, so this was end of March, like mid-April, they did did do a bronch and just saw a bunch of necrotic tissue in his airway. They didn't try to debride it or do anything else. He wasn't having hemoptysis at that time. But uh, I have never seen this, this complication develop with a pulmonary artery to bronchial fistula like this. But you can see back here, I don't really see any abnormality of the pulmonary artery on this more re on the more remote study here but now you can clearly see this big pseudoaneurysm pooching into the what is now this big hole communicating with his carina and you know tragically he so he came in with some small volume hemoptysis and a few minutes after this study was done he uh, ended up he ended up having massive hemoptysis was intubated and eventually they withdrew care and he he passed, but this was just you know pretty uh, dramatic radiation induced. I guess you call it just bronchial pulmonary bronco arterial fistula with a pulmonary artery or something, whatever term you want to use. Yeah. Um, and I will show you this. Uh, this pathology was a new one to me. This was a lymphoepithelioma like carcinoma of his lung. And then, as you see, the pathologist says here is a subtype of large cell carcinoma on that. So this was a new pathology for me, but that was based on the the resection of the whole tumor. So I don't know. That's not that's the uh, not the most important point part of this case. But I don't know. Have you guys ever seen a, a, a pulmonary artery fistula like this? No, uh, no, no, no. Where did the oh, official go? Did he cough it out, or did it drop into the ear? I, that's a really good question. Uh, this uh, is that it right there? No, that's all staple line, and I don't know. He must have coughed it out. He must have coughed it out with the um, yeah, with the with the blood. Wow. Yes. Unless, uh, what's that? That doesn't look as dense. No, and that was there too before. So that's just that's just surgical material. Yeah, good, good point. I hadn't thought about that. So, wow. So the fiducial the fiducial has been embol or has been hemoptysized too. So, or or expectorated. So, that's bad. Yeah, I'll show um, I'll show one more here. This is um, another lung cancer case that's kind of curious because I had never seen this type of response before. This is an adenocarcinoma, and this was, I can't remember if this was at the time of biopsy or, what, or if this was just at the time of diagnosis, which is immaterial. But here you see the cancer. And so it was confirmed as an adenocarcinoma, and they put him on something. I think they put him on Tarsiva. And, this, and then five months later, you'll see what's happened to it which was quite an interesting response in my mind. So basically the tumor melted, but left a reasonable size cavity here. Mm. And yeah, which was kind of, which was really interesting because they subsequently, so we, we discussed this at Tumor Board and they didn't really know, you know, what this, if there was any tumor left in here or not, um, but they proceeded to do a lobectomy. He didn't have any distant disease. And uh, on the final pathology, that it was just some residual adenocarcinoma with treatment effect. So the margins were negative, but I guess there were some residual tumor cells in there. But I just thought that was really interesting because we you know, sometimes see these bubbly adenocarcinomas, but this is purely a treatment effect that resulted in this. So, so on, the, on the earlier CT, was there low attenuation that would suggest that maybe there was mucus, uh, you know, some secretions? Good question. It? Yeah, no, it all looked... Um, it all looks pretty uh, soft tissue. Well, 50, 40, 60, 
But yeah, I, that's a good question. I don't, I don't. Maybe it was a bubbly adenocarcinoma that had more um, mucus. I mean, it's, it's not pure mucus, but yeah, maybe there was more mucus and less soft tissue than we give it credit for at this at the at or, that point. Because could it be like these, you know, these other um, uh, with tyrosine kinase inhibitors, like you see with the renal cells, that where they don't get smaller, but they become lower attenuation. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. In this case, it, it, it's cleared. Yeah, it's just weird. But it was also, of course, yeah, they were, and then they were like, well, how much tumor's left? And we assumed that there was some here, but you don't you don't know. But uh, they did show that there were some residual cells on, on path, so. And the other I thing, too, that was a, it said an interesting that response. He had N2 disease, did that change as well with the, with the erlotinib? Oh, I don't know. That, I, w I wonder if that's why he underwent just neoadjuvant before they uh, yeah. packed it out. I don't even remember what his. Because uh, it said in the note in T, uh, it was T yeah. or something. Yeah, N two. Yeah, so yeah, I, I, oh, I, I guess I'll have to pull up the pet. If if they, um... I, you know, I think the other mechanism you might um, think about is um, necrosis from the chemotherapy and then liquefaction and coughing it out. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's, yeah, I don't, I don't know. So the two nodes that they took out here isn't a lot, but there was nothing there. I guess they, yeah, they gave him 3A based on the, the PET and with the N2 nodes, so. Because I, I don't see any yeah. large mediastinal nodes. So you just, because I was no. wondering if there were, if you saw a similar effect, but I guess not. No, I don't see any. I don't see any uh, subcarinal or or mediastinal nodes that are at least big. So yeah, I'll have to go back and look at the pet. But yeah, I just thought that was an interesting, you know, evolution of lung cancer after treatment. So, all right. Well, I will uh, hand over there. All right. Cool. Anyone else got cases? I have some uh, cases. Hi, right, Brett. Let's see. Can you see? Uh, wait. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, so this, we're doing a lot of um, yeah, post uh, tabby imaging, and um, uh, this is a case that we're type of case we're seeing more and more uh, here. This is a um, uh, a portico valve here, uh, transcatheter valve that you can see in the aorta, and if you um, focus on the axial image here. Um, in the lower left corner, you can see that the uh, the valve itself, the bioprosthetic uh, valve leaflets, do not look normal. Um, they're uh, quite thick. There you can see thickening of that leaflet and the other leaflet right there that we're seeing here. And we're going to um, just reformat that in order to show that. And you can see on the um, on kind of the coronal view that I have here that this leaflet is very, very thick. And um, on the axial reformatted view here, double oblique view, you can see that that leaflet is, is thick, very thick there. And I have this set up to play so that you can see that what happens when we play this. And you can see that leaflet looks fairly, uh, you know, almost fixed, uh, very restricted motion of that leaflet. Um, looking here in the other view, you can see that the, uh, the leaflet, especially on the base, is very, very restricted in motion. And I'm going to spin this around a bit so you can see that um, it's not just that leaflet, but um, the other leaflet right here. So two really two out of three leaflets here um, have uh, thickening, and th this was done about four weeks after the procedure after Tavi, and so this is presumably um, thrombus, uh, leaflet thrombus that we're seeing um, a fair amount now, and can cause leaflet restriction. Notice that if anyone's struck by this thrombus, there is a thrombus in the left uh, atrium here, and, and maybe in the uh, atrial appendage tip as well. Um, but really, this, this is a phenomenon that we're seeing more and more now that's been, um, of course, published. And um, so uh, you can see the uh, this is probably causing an outflow um, gradient here, although the echo, interestingly, didn't really show a gradient. You could imagine that there might be a gradient there. So um, just a nice example of a tabby uh, thrombus. And these patients have been going on, you know, anticoagulation to help clear these. And I showed a couple of months ago, of, you know, cases of that had actually just completely resolved after anticoagulation. So 
Um, unfortunately, this was a patient who actually has some contraindications to anticoagulation, so I'm not sure. I haven't checked over the last couple of days to see what they've actually done um, with this patient, but I, I just thought that was a good example of restricted leaflet motion from TAVI with uh, leaflet thrombus. Mm. Yeah, great. And uh, we get go on to another case. Um, this is, you know, this case is not as great as some of the great cases we've seen this hour, but let me change the screen here. It's just a classic case, but what I like about this is it has um, correlation, correlative imaging here. So this is a patient who has, if you look in the, um, you know, the breast, breast tissue here, you know, multiple uh, well-defined uh, little nodules and um, some of high attenuation, some of these are calcified, some of them are not calcified. There's some architectural distortion within the breast tissue and, you know, it looks like free silicone injection. And, and um, the lungs, if I were to, well, I'll show you the lungs, but it's a little distracting because this is not, um, it's kind of a red herring, was not really acutely um, acting like a silicone embolism. And I think these injections were from a, a while ago. So um, lungs are a little bit dirty here, ground glass and some nodularities, but I think that was part of, um, you know, an infection going on. But uh, here's what I like about this case because you do have a mammographic correlation and you can see the, um, you know, the typical appearance of, of just multiple uh, areas of calcified, non-calcified nodules from silicone, uh, free silicone injections within the breast, breast. So just nice mammographic correlation in this case. <coughs> And uh, here's another one I just wanted to get people's uh, opinions on here. Um, let me change the screen. All right, so this patient has no history, no known history of um, radiation therapy, um, uh, does not have um, any prior history of lymphoma or anything like that. Um, you can see already the uh, significant abnormality here. The, um, you know, there's, there's uh, plural calcification and thickening. There's hypertrophy of the extracorporeal fat there. Um, there is, uh, you know, an aorta that is, let me show you how it goes from looking relatively normal to having this high attenuation rim um, calcification. And not only that, but it's also uh, um, sort of compressed and um, um, and you can imagine how it looks like it's, it's looks like it's tacked down a bit. Um, we're also seeing some uh, some hyler, um, calcified hyler uh, lymph nodes, and what I thought at first looked like it was a sequela of kind of calcified chronic PE, um, but in thinking about this case, um, you know, I was wondering if, if you all thought that, and similar findings actually extend out to the abdomen, uh, that look almost, you know, like a, uh, a mild um, uh, retroperitoneal fibrosis down here. And so um, putting this all together, I would wonder if this is kind of a, a prior um, histo or something else causing um, a, uh, a fibrosing myosinitis type of appearance where the pulmonary artery and probably the vein uh, were affected and the pleura and the aorta and all that remodeling, you know, possibly due to a fibrosing um, infection from the past. The, um, can you show the long one? So it looks like there is venous... And there's venous congestion, yeah. you know, there's definitely what looks like venous congestion. And so that would, you know, to me, this fits more with like a prior kind of a fibrosing mesotonitis type picture, you know. Now, I've never seen pleural involvement with it, though. That's the only funny thing. Or the aorta. Could this be an IgG4 sclerosing disease, given the retroperitoneal stuff? Maybe so. Maybe this is that. Um I mean, the lung, yeah. the right hilum looks really good for like a fibrosing hilitis, but, you know, hist I've never seen it in the plural space. I don't know, David or Howard, Travis, anyone else? I don't think so. There's nothing in the spleen, and I didn't see any granulomas in the lungs, so I was wondering about IgG4, too. I think that's um, that would be something to consider. The person wasn't taking Sansert or something like that that causes, you know, one of those old migraine drugs that would cause... Um, Mesonomal fibrosis, retroperitoneal fibrosis. Not to my knowledge. I didn't notice that in, in looking at the medications. But that's interesting. Maybe it is a um, IgG4. Well, there are calcifications in nodes there, but more inferiorly in the lower mediastinal fat near the diaphragm. Is that another calcified node going even lower? Oh, and, and, and there. 
and even lower where there's some in relation to the liver or right there is that in calcified node i think that's a calcified node as well yeah yeah i wonder if this is a strange form of uh, granulomatous disease in which the pleura is conspicuously involved and are there calcifications near the aorta in i don't know what um yeah, there's some other calcifications down here, and there's another node there. Looks like a calcified node there. Oh, that's then, very interesting. Because the uh, appearance of the lung with presumably fibrous tissue and narrowing and occlusion, presumably of veins with lung edema, all of that is very consistent with a sequel of a granulomatous mediastinitis. Maybe, T maybe TB. Um, huh. I just thought this is a dramatic, you know, kind of showing it because I had never seen it before. It looked like this. <laughs> TB is would be great for the uh, for the right. widespread pleural calcification. This is an older guy. Yes, yes. Maybe it is TB. Maybe it was TB that caused this. Wow. Yeah. That, that could cause GFM. And right. sometimes they are asymmetric like this. So the right side is more affected than the left in terms of of the lung and the and the mediastinum and presumably the veins that are occluded and narrowed and so on. That asymmetry is interesting too, but I think we've seen that before. All right. Well, thanks. That, yeah. Great. And um, let me see if I have. Let's see. Oh, this is just a. Uh, I'll just show uh, one more. Let's see. So this is just an interesting radiograph. So I'll just put the radiograph up, and then I'll go to the um, the CT in a second. But uh, you know, I, I was just going along with this radiograph, and and uh, nothing at first caught my eye. But um, does anything catch anyone's eye here? Well, I see one thing. But can you change the window width and the window level as well? Yep. Um, well, there's a little nodular opacity that projects over a rib in the inferior scapula on the left. Yeah, that's what I that's what I saw at first, and then I yeah. there's an extra thing uh, over the aortic arch too. Yeah, super high uh, on the left hilum. Lateral right. to the aortic arch, there may be something in the lung or bronchial tree in the left suprahilar region. There's an opacity there. Yeah, yeah. So that's 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 abnormal. And then there's one other thing. Let me show you the um, the other kind of larger abnormality that I I was embarrassed at first. I didn't see it, um, you know. And uh, but all those things are true. That are almost look at this. The the rib uh, is you know, you know really really. And uh, this was that extra contour that we were seeing. Mm. Um, on the but the the rib is largely destroyed immediately there. And um, this was a case, I believe this was renal cell. Um, and let's go back to the radiograph. And uh, there's something in that left breast too, wasn't there? Was that metastatic renal cell as well? well left breast is gone, isn't it? It, it looked like he showed a little, yeah, that stuff right yeah. there. I think it, yeah, it was breast, sorry, breast cancer. I'm mixing up my cases here, but breast cancer. But I think interesting is that, like, look at the, uh, the frontal again, so this whole rib is missing here. Right, right, yeah. So, uh, so I, I, I think I, I saw, I saw this first, and then I saw this, but I didn't. For some reason, my my brain filled the rib in, so I didn't see the fact that it was, you know, missing this large part of the rib was missing there. So, I think it's a, it, it's a good radiograph, and it just, you know, it shows, shows me that you can still, you know, walk by things that are relatively yeah. <laughs> large and thing. You know, we can all go by the complete absence of the uh, left breast and <laughs> just you know. right, right. right. <laughs> this was, is, this was is the pedicle missing at that level too? If you zoom in on the spine, does it? It looks like extend so. medially yeah. all the way to the vertebral column. Probably is. Let's see. Yeah, right. So this pedicle is is missing. So, so yeah. I mean, there's a lot that obviously we can. Wow. That that we can, I can still you know learn from radiographs here that <laughs> um so yeah thankfully this is you know picked up a couple things and it was already known anyway but you know that's uh, a large uh no, uh, so, so, this was recurrent in the left breast then 
I believe so. Yeah. Yeah. And, and Brent, just to add more fuel onto the fire, look at the left costophrenic cell because there's a fracture down there. Oh, yes. Yeah, there's a, there's a rib that's involved. There's yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, um, left lateral costophrenic cell because there's a rib right. right destroyed there. Yep. Yeah. Well, if we're going to pile on, how about the uh, left supraclavicular companion shadow? Is there a lymphadenopathy yeah. up there, too? Yeah, let's take a look there. <clears throat> no, maybe. I'm looking. You see we are kind of missing it, right? So let's let's go back to the CT and see if we have something up there. Oh, whoops, I'm going to the wrong. This is one of those one case teaching files. Right, right. Let's see here. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just a fake out. Huh? Maybe it was a fake no, out. That's, that's a strikeout. But anyway, I just thought this was a good for multiple reasons. <laughs> but anyway, those are my cases. Yeah. I'd like to end on a humble note. We had always humbled. Yeah. <laughs> That's a great one. Howard, I think we all we need to collect these perception challenge cases and and publish a hundred of them in some form. Or fifty of them, because we have a lot, you know, all all these radiographs. Yeah. Yeah. No one will ever read a radiograph again after that, Travis. Care everyone. True. <laughs> It'll be like was it bone age and scoliosis days? They used to go in the in the back in the old days in the back of. The <laughs> now you just put in someone else's work list. All right, guys. Thanks. Well, um, I've got a couple of cases if you. You want um, yeah, the last couple? A couple minutes. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay. So this is a patient um, that had, and I'm afraid I don't have a lot of details about the nature of the vascular abnormality, but he had partial resection of the right anterior first rib for, as best I can tell, a diagnosis made elsewhere of thoracic venous outlet syndrome. So just to zoom into that area, you can see, as best I can tell, a relatively small portion of rib has been removed, and there is a small amount of pleural or extra pleural fluid in that location. So it's the kind, and then presumably a surgical drain or some other device. So this, you know, in terms of a post-operative radiograph is unremarkable. I just read and described the findings, and I think that that whole procedure was rather uneventful. And then that is on the 4th, and by the 10th he was symptomatic and he came into hospital, and I don't know if he had imaging elsewhere, but this was a really big surprise. So this is pleural fluid, turned out to be, as you might suspect, blood. And the only thing I can think of is this is some form of delayed hemothorax. Maybe they injured a vessel that bled slowly, I think he might have been on anticoagulants, which exacerbated that. So this is just an unusual complication, somewhat delayed, of a large hemothorax and imaged about uh, six days after the chest radiograph that I showed you. So the fluid was drained, it is bloody, and was described as a post-operative complication, hemothorax. Uh, this is just something that does happen. So this is a patient with really bad emphysema. He had a CT-guided biopsy of a lesion that was increasing there. And um, here on the <clears throat> last image of the procedure, you can see the procedure was done on the left side. You can see both some pleural air, but quite a lot of hemorrhage in the lung. So, you know, we see this and it's a bit unusual to see this amount of hemorrhage. Um, after or soon after a biopsy. So this is pulmonary hemorrhage and the blood is pooling in part in the emphysematous bullet that I showed you with a little bit of pneumothorax. And he actually did okay in spite of a scary amount of procedural related hemorrhage from that. And I'll save the other one for next time. Uh, All right. Jeff. Thank you. All right, guys. We'll have a great week and um, uh, talk to you later. Okay, Thank take you. care. Bye, Thank everyone. You. Peace, everyone. Bye.